It's not about you. It's not about your comfort. It's about the people who are suffering, people who sorely need your support. It's about the fathers who don't see their children. After family breakdowns, uh, all too many of whom commit suicide as a result. It's about the children who are emotionally abused because they're denied access to their fathers and grandparents. It's about the grandparents denied access to their beloved grandchildren. It's about the men who are battered by their partners and find there's no support available for them. It's about the men who've had their genitals mutilated as minors on religious or cultural grounds. So I strongly urge you to step outside your comfort zone, put the keyboard to one side, and engage in activism to support these people. They, they, they deserve your support. Our next presenter wrote his own introduction, which I'm not going to read. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Mike Buchanan was the founder of the British political party Justice for Men and Boys in 2013 and continues to lead it. It remains the only party in the English-speaking world campaigning for the human rights of men and boys on many fronts. It's also the only anti-feminist party in the English-speaking world. He is the author of 10 books, including one on the institution of marriage, The Fraud of the Rings, and Feminism, the Ugly Truth. Gentlemen and ladies, Mike Buchanan. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Today, I'll be talking about the empathy gap, the growing unpopularity of feminism, feminism as a political force, and the seeds it's sowing, which will eventually destroy it as a political force. Five years have passed since Paul Lee Lamb hosted the first ICMI in Detroit in 2014. It was a pivotal event in the lives of many, including myself. Public understanding about men's issues and feminism has increased enormously, I think, over the last five years. And in part, I think, because of these conferences. You know, if you look at the YouTube hits on the, uh, on the talks, not mine, obviously, but other people's, Janice's and Karen's, you know, they're always big. <laughs> and uh, I find myself becoming ever more optimistic about the future demise of feminism as a political force. Now, that will come as a surprise to many, because feminism has never been more powerful as a political force and it continues to become still more powerful with every passing year. The tide's not going to turn soon, which I think you, you were kind of saying, Janice, in your talk today. The, 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 the two compelling objectives of influential feminists are to extend the privileges of women and girls, which inevitably requires the disadvantaging of men and boys, and to provide secure and often well-paid employment for themselves. They achieve both objectives, of course, not through merit, but by corrupting institutions. And I have to say, to date, in the UK at least, while social media have made uh, a major contribution to raising people's understanding of feminism and men's issues, they have had precisely zero impact on feminists' corruption of institutions. Zero. That corruption is close to complete in some institutions, and I shall be illustrating that ironically with reference to the British Conservative Party. One of the key issues which has enabled feminism to become a powerful political force is the empathy gap. And it's not something we talk about much at ICMIs, and we, sh we should talk more. Many in this audience are already familiar with the work of William Collins, a, a British blogger, to my mind, the most insightful blogger in the world on gender issues. His blog is called The Illustrated Empathy Gap. The website is empathygap.uk. <coughs> Two months ago, LPS Publishing, my, my, my modest publishing concern, published his book titled The Empathy Gap, Male Disadvantages and the Mechanisms of Their Neglect. It's almost 700 pages long. The reference section alone is 64 pages. You get your money's worth with Collins, I think. And the, the first chapter starts with this. The primary purpose of this book is to present the evidence for men and boys being disadvantaged 
across a wide range of areas, including education, health, criminal justice, parenthood, and safeguarding. Most data apply to the UK, so unless otherwise specified, it's the UK to which I refer. Inferences from the situation in the UK can then be drawn for other Western and Anglophone nations. A secondary purpose is to examine why there is currently such a disconnect between what the evidence suggests and the popular and academic perception of the status of males. These two features, the male disadvantages together with the minimal societal concern which they provoke, constitute the empathy gap. Both women and men display this muted empathy towards males. End of extract. Hey you! Yes you! Watching this video! Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again or for the very first time with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The disc set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as disc set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind the scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never before seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch, such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. I do urge people here to, to buy the book. There's a few copies, or at least there were, in the exhibit hall. It's, it's, it's truly a tour de force, and I don't say that lightly. I turn now to the unpopularity of feminism. Given the power of feminism as a political force, it's all too easy to forget how little popular support it has. The Fawcett Society is a British feminist charity founded in the Victorian era, and in 2016 it published a, published a report titled Sex Equality, State of the Nation Report. The charity had commissioned a poll of over 8,000 people who were asked about their beliefs on a wide range of issues from gender identity and men in positions of power to support for women's equality. The poll found that only 9% of women, 9%, and 4% of men described themselves as feminists. So overall, just a, a, about 7% of British adults uh, self-identify as feminists, one in 14 adults. Now this slightly unwelcome finding for the Forces Society forced some creative thinking, and on, ten, on page 10 of the report they stated this. There is a pro-equality majority in the UK today, including amongst men. These hidden feminists, I, 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 I know I love it, these hidden feminists don't necessarily use the term to describe themselves, but support the key principle of feminism that there should be equality for women and men. End of extract. Hidden feminists. Feminism seeks equality for men and women. I mean, they, they, they can be hilarious when they try. Um, Hope Not Hate is a hate-driven, ironically, a hate-driven left-wing organisation which has been deeply critical of the men's rights movement and our political party. The organisation recently funded a poll which found that a third of British adults, aged 18 to 24, agreed with this statement. Feminism is to blame for making some men feel marginalised and demonised in society. And 42% of men across all age groups agreed. Now, it, it would be pushing things to say that the people who agreed with the statement are anti-feminists, and I won't adopt the Fawcett Society approach and say they're hidden anti-feminists. But at the very least, we can say that public support for, for feminism in the UK is weak, and public opposition to it considerably stronger. I turn now to feminism as a political force, and for, uh, for many decades, feminists have been getting what they want in the public sphere by manipulating men, just as women have always manipulated men in the private sphere. Their primary tactic is the same in both, both spheres, and it's very successful. It's simply the shaming of men. Uh, men are just so, you know, are just so, so prone to accepting shame. In the UK, there's hardly a major inst institution which hasn't been corrupted by feminists in the course of the past 50 years. And I think it's important to be candid about the scale of the feminist victory, to better formulate our responses. 
It's all too easy to say that the dam's about to break, that the tide's about to turn. Neither thing is going to happen anytime soon. A small number of radical feminists, feminists today wield enormous power and influence in government, the civil service, the judiciary, the crown prosecution service, education, academia, the media, book publishing, and many other areas besides. Height and physical fitness requirements have been compromised in order to get more women into the police, the fire service, and the armed forces. Cressida Dick, the wonderfully named lesbian head of the Metropolitan... <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I said to myself, don't make a joke about that, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm weak, what can I say? Cressida, <coughs> the lesbian head of the Metropolitan Police in London, announced a long-term goal of 50% of police officers in London being female. I can't recall seeing a single criticism uh, about that uh, in the mainstream media. Not one politician commented on it. The Royal Navy recently admitted that over the past few years, 35 pregnant women had been airlifted from its ships. So kind of a mass outbreak of immaculate conceptions there, isn't it? That's all I can say. Now, um, feminist corruption of the wealth-generating sector, the private sector, continues unchallenged, with demands for ever more women in boardrooms, although a causal link between increasing female representation on boards and corporate financial decline has been reported in longitudinal studies since at least 2008. The latest such study was published just two months ago. The Conservative Party, in sole power since 2015, following five years in the coalition, has completely surrendered to feminism, with the sole exception of Philip Davis, the Conservative MP who just spoke in, in, in the other room. Um, he also spoke at our 2016 London conference on the justice gender gap. And what, what, what had prompted that was, um, he said so many MPs were saying that women were treated unfairly in the, uh, you know, in the criminal justice system. So he had the, British, sorry, he had the uh, House of Commons Library do some research, and of course found that the, the truth was the complete opposite of that. And that's, that's what initially got him in, you know, interested in advocating for men. Um, the only elected politician in the English-speaking world that I'm aware of who ever advocates for men. Uh, a truly astonishing man. Uh, following the recent resignation of Theresa May as Conservative Party leader, there were ten candidates for the position. Uh, eight women, I think, and, and two men. Their, their, their teams were asked by The Guardian, a very left-wing newspaper, if their candidates were feminists. Eight of the ten candidates' team immediately said that they were. Yeah. Dominic Raab rather weakly said he pr probably wasn't one in an interview. And this from the man who many years ago had famously referred to feminists as obnoxious bigots. <laughs> Got that right. While Esther McVeigh, Philip Davis's fiance, perhaps wisely declined to respond. And, uh, she, she, uh, and she is now a cabinet minister. The 10 candidates were whittled down to, to two in a series of MPs votes to Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson. Party members then selected Boris Johnson as party leader and therefore the new prime minister. Two weeks before the contest was over, the two men were asked questions on women's issues by Fleur Butler, the chair of the Conservative Women's, women's Organization, and Ella Robertson, the chair of Young Conservative Women. Afterwards, the two women announced this. Whoever the, whoever the next prime minister will be, both men have shown that the Conservative Party is a modern feminist organization which is committed to equality, end of quote. Um, now, Boris Johnson is, I think, very much of a, a like mind with our former feminist uh, Prime Minister David Cameron on gender political issues. And he's, he's got very few, if any, con uh, social conservative leanings, from what, from what I can see. Um, it's not even known to the British public quite how many kids he has by how many women, but um, it ma makes me proud. Um, <laughs> sorry, we, we can cut that out, Tom, can't we? Um, so, at, at the last hustings before he became Prime Minister, Johnson described himself as absolutely a feminist to applause from the audience of uh, Conservative Party members and a few groans. And he said this, a feminist is someone who believes fundamentally in the equality of human beings and the equality of the sexes. That's what I believe. End of quote. 
Now, I don't for a second believe that Boris Johnson, a very intelligent man, thinks that feminists believe that. I don't believe that for a second. But, you know, he then stated he wouldn't support all women shortlists to increase the number of female politicians in the Tory party, saying, I'm not certain that introducing quotas, which are by their nature discriminatory, are the way to solve the problem. End of quotation. There is, of course, no bloody problem to be solved. And the problem is, once you accept the problem as a promise, that the premise that there's a problem, you know, you're doomed. Anyway, um, at the last count, men outnumbered women 10 to 1 as prospective parliamentary candidates, you know, the people who will go on to become MPs. Um, so t t 10 to 1, men to women. And over 25% of MPs today are female. By, by, by this measure, women are already hugely overrepresented as MPs. And I remind you that this is the Conservative Party I'm talking about. Most parties are to the left of them, and therefore even more in the grip of feminists. Sir Vince Cable, uh, leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, proudly stated during a House of Commons uh, committee meeting last year that, it had the, that the party had women-only shortlists for winnable seats. We must assume the party has men-only shortlist for unwinnable seats. And f uh, four, f uh, four weeks ago, Vince Cable was replaced as party leader by a radical feminist, Joe Swinson, another miserable, passive-aggressive, hatchet-faced, men-hating Harridan. <laughs> I'm not a big fan. <laughs> in summary, the political class in the UK, including the Conservative Party, has utterly surrendered to feminism. An ideology, I remind you, is espoused by only one in 14 British adults and opposed by many more. And I'd like to illustrate just how feminist corruption of the political system can play out in practice with an example. The Ministry of Justice recently announced the launch of a family justice panel. Ten of the 11 members of the panel are women. They, they include academics and a senior woman from Women's Aid, a feminist organization which continues to espouse the long discredited Duluth model of domestic violence. The only man on the panel is Stephen Cobb, a senior High Court judge who seemingly consults only with women's organizations such as Women's, women's Aid. Now, uh, Philip Davis MP, who I was speaking about a moment ago, posted some written questions as follows. To ask the Secretary of State for Justice what the criteria were for the selection of people to join the review on how the family courts protect children and parents in cases of domestic abuse and other serious offences. Whether one of the criteria was equality of gender representation. <laughs> Bless him. Um, <laughs> I bet he laughed when he came out with that line. Um, for what reason that selection did not include representatives of fathers or men, and if he'll make a statement. So that was the end of his questions. Paul Maynard, MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Justice, replied as follows. The members of the panel established to gather evidence on the protections pro provided by the family courts in cases involving domestic abuse and other serious offenses were appointed for their expertise on the issue. The panel includes the preeminent academics, senior judiciary, women's aid, <laughs> so I, can't, I laugh every time I read this, um, women's aid to represent victims. Isn't that glorious? <laughs> um, the chief social worker and the association of children's lawyers to represent practitioners. The panel will launch a public call for evidence open to all individuals and organizations and is considering other mechanisms for generating, for gathering the full range of views on the issues. Now, the preeminent academics on the panel are, of course, feminists. Uh, Paul Maynard declined to respond to Philip Davis's questions concerning equality of gender representation and why there were no representatives of fathers or men on the panel. I turn now to the issue of how feminism sows the seeds of its own destruction. Feminists corrupt institutions, usually by shaming men to hand them power on a plate. But the feminist movement has, it seems to me, an Achilles heel. Namely, feminists' insatiable appetite for female privilege. It is absolutely insatiable. Often that privilege is blatant and undeniable. And one recent example is the Lawn Tennis Championships at Wimbledon in London, where we see the, the, Wim the Wimbledon racket. I thought more people might get that pun, but there we go. <laughs> the, uh, 
Now, th th this, this racket has been going on for 13 years so far, with men and women being paid equal prize money since 2007. Despite the money coming into the championships from broadcasting rights and ticket sales for the men's game, far exceeding that for the women's game. The women's game, frankly, is, is a financial parasite on the men's game, um, certainly as far as Wimbledon's concerned, as it is in a number of other sports. Now, in the women's final this year, Simona Halep beat Serena Williams 6-2, 6-2 in an eye-wateringly dull game of... <laughs> it was... Oh, I, I was losing the will to live, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, it took under an hour, thank God. At least it didn't go on for a long time. Um, so, so it was a total of just 16 games. In the men's final, by stark contrast, Novak Djokovic beat Roger Federer after five sets following a tie-break. The men's final lasted more than four hours longer than the women's final. There were a total of 68 games in the men's final, more than four times as many as in the women's final. And what, are, and what are the runners-up, Serena Williams and Roger Federer, who took home the same prize money? Serena Williams won four games in her final, while Roger Federer won 36 in his. 36. Nine games for every game that Williams won. If nothing else, you know, cases like this bring it home to men and a few women who are capable of being shamed. Um, just what feminist, call, feminist calls for gender equality are all about, they're always demands for privilege. So the Wimbledon racket is the term I use for the privilege of women um, calling for what they call gender equality, and it can be seen wherever and whenever feminists are at their evil work. The seeds that, the, the seeds that feminism sows, which will eventually lead to its destruction, are the impacts it has on institutions which affect the lives of individual men, women, and children. Now, of course, it goes without saying, really, that feminists have no interest in the effectiveness or efficiency of institutions, their sole concern is that those inst institutions privilege women and girls in general, and feminists in particular, regardless of the consequences. I think a major problem for, the, for feminism in the long term is the nature of women, and this is becoming clearer year after year, I think. And particularly how women act when faced with choices, rather than what they say in public, because so few women are prepared to publicly criticize women as a class or as individuals. And I think they're all at this conference, all the women in the world who are prepared to do that. <laughs> women are increasingly refusing to march to the tunes of feminists who they know are bitter, angry, delusional, dysfunctional, men-hating liars. Other than that, no problem. Um, <laughs> feminists are the only group in society actively seeking to make women more anxious, angry and bitter in part through their lying, relentless lying narratives about rape and domestic violence. Now, every, every other Sunday, I campaign with other MRAs at Speaker's Corner in London, and I could always tell when it's a feminist approaching me, because she'll have that s sour hangdog expression that they, that they have. Um, the only thing I, I heard once, and uh, you know, I think there might be some truth in this, that, that feminists are encouraged to chew on thick slices of lemon first thing every morning <laughs> to, to set their expressions for the day. Now, it hopefully goes without saying that feminists have no interest in the happiness of men, but they also, of course, have no interest in the happiness of women and children, who they regard as, as acceptable collateral damage in their war against men. But women have had enough of being told by bossy feminists that they're victims, being told what they should think, and how they should act and behave. They're sick to death of being told to hate men, to consider work as more emotionally rewarding than family life, for the vast majority, they know that's, 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 not, that's not true. And to be aggressive and assertive towards men. I've already pointed to the fact that only 9% of British women, 1 in 11, identify as feminists. I'd also say that, that only a tiny proportion of feminists have the slightest understanding of the ideology that they, that they espouse. And I find this every time I engage with, um, with the lemon chewers at Speaker's Corner. Um, and it's, it's, it's always like engaging with particularly dim-witted children. It's, it's, I could weep at times. I really could. Um, their understanding of their own ideology is woeful, certainly compared with MRA's understanding of, uh, of feminism. 
Um, I turn now to feminist corruption of the workplace. In the UK, many fields of employment have become ever more feminized, and one consequence has always, always been a reduction in effectiveness and efficiency. I'm thinking here of fields including politics, the uh, politics, Jess Phillips, MP, do I need to say anything more? Um, the civil service, education, the law, media, the police, medicine, including veterinary medicine. And I'd like to just consider for a moment the impact of feminist corruption of the medical profession. In the UK, medical schools have been preferencing women over men when selecting students for well over 40 years. And Dr. Vernon Coleman, the first British TV doctor, was warning in the mid-1970s of the inevitable consequences. He pointed to the reluctance of female doctors to work on social hours and to work in more stressful environments such as A&E. He pointed to women in general having a weaker, a weaker work ethic than men um, and all the negative consequences he predicted 45 years ago have indeed come to pass. Today, 70% of medical students in the UK are female and the average female graduate of a medical school will work half the hours of, uh, over her career compared with her male counterpart. Um, indeed, many, many will never practice medicine at all because it's well known, you know, it's, I've often heard medical schools you know, being, being called the best dating agencies in the world. Um, and so so to, to, put, to put the stats another way, the taxpayer needs to fund the, ex, the very expensive training of two female medical students to get the same career work hours as from one male student. And men in the UK pay almost three quarters of the income taxes which, which largely fund that training. We're also um, in the UK very heavily dependent on, uh, on, on, on medics from some very poor countries, you know, from, from, from India, um, uh, you know, in particular I guess, but some African countries. Countries which, which can barely afford the sort of quarter million pound equivalent plus of training and um, as soon as they've trained, we steal them. It's the same with Eastern Europe. I mean, you know, I, there are Eastern European countries where a doctor in the UK will earn 10 times more than, 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 than in those countries. Um, it's, it's really shocking. Um, most general practitioners today are women. F 40 years ago, I could reliably get an appointment with my GP within 24 hours. The last time I booked an appointment, just a month ago, I, I had to wait three weeks to see my GP. Um, and yet, everyone knows what the problem is, but of course, no, pol no politician you know, can, can, can say that. But, but of course, women and children too are also experiencing a second-class service. It's not just men. Because of, this predict you know, because of the predicted consequences of privileging women over men in entering the medical profession. So the more that feminists corrupt institutions, the more society becomes dysfunctional, the more people are unhappy and recognize feminism as the driving force, as the common link between so many of the issues which make them unhappy. Now, of course, institutions need not be formal organizations in the sense of workplaces, and two key, two key institutions which have been under attack by feminists in the, in the UK and elsewhere for half a century through the state and the justice system are marriage and the nuclear family. And one consequence of the feminist destruction of marriage and the nuclear family, of course, is fatherlessness, um, an absolutely evil blight upon society, which, we, which, which we've heard quite a bit about at this conference, I'm pleased to say. Um, but the, 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 the negative consequences of fatherlessness hardly need pointing out to this audience. But the scale of human suffering caused by denying children access to, to their fathers, almost always fathers, grandparents and others, is, is, is enormous, and it's child abuse. And we shouldn't be surprised that the male suicide rate increases threefold following divorce. We wouldn't be remotely surprised to see the female suicide rate uh, rising three, threefold after divorce if we deprived mo mothers of their children. So feminists create problems which lead to ever more dysfunctional societies and ever more human misery and suffering. And as I say, more and more people are recognizing feminism is the common link to all this. You know, and people are joining the dots. So public opinion is turning against feminism, and a backlash is inevitable. When it'll happen, I don't know, but it, it is absolutely inevitable. Now, there's a time lag between public opinion changing and politicians and the mainstream media realizing it's changing. Philip Davis always says that MPs are 10 years behind the general public uh, on, on so many issues, and he's, he's quite right. Now, as, as some have pointed out at previous conferences, politics is downstream from culture. So changing public opinions present both a threat 
but also an opportunity to politicians, the class that can do something about the state's many actions and inactions which assault the human rights of men and boys. Um, all the major parties in the UK court only the women's vote. And by definition, most of the time, they're, they're, you know, it's completely, you know, they're, they're, they're failing. It will take only one major political party to start reaping an electoral dividend by proposing non-feminist policy, policy directions, perhaps by better supporting, or starting to support again, the institutions of marriage and the nuclear family. Other parties will then have little choice but to compete with that party for votes. And I, I see that happening within the next few years. I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Across the developed world, we're seeing a swing away from progressive or liberal politics and a revival of conservatism. And of course, I, I, I say that knowing that conservatism is, is no walk in the park for, for, for men either. But one defining pr feature of progressives is that they never, or liberals, is that they never accept they've been wrong in the past. They, never have they ever made any mistakes, um, despite all the evidence to the contrary. So they never slay their sacred cows. Um, in stark contrast, conservatives, um, despite the name, have changed their positions on a number of key issues, or at least I think the, va the vast majority have, certainly in the UK, and, the, and, and they're looking forward to slaying a few sacred cows. Conservatives have been bludgeoned by their opponents for decades, but are, 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 are becoming much better at challenging progressive ideologies, including feminism. Now, the, the, the conservative revival will hopefully contribute to the, to the destruction of feminism as a political force, and in part, I think, through its opposition to abortion. Historians today estimate that over 100 million people died as a result of the actions and inactions of communist governments. The number of killings we can attribute to feminist influence is far, far higher if we include the killing of unborn children, and I think we should include those killings. <clears throat> Femini feminism is, among other things, a death cult. In the UK alone, over 10 million unborn children have been killed since the 1967 Abortion Act, and every year in the UK, another 200,000 or so unborn children are killed in the place they should be safest, in their mother's wombs. Abortion is, for me, a men's issue, a men's rights issue, as much as it is a woman's rights issue. And I say that, of course, although, of course, those killed are of both sexes. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I oppose abortion only for males. I mean, that would just be sick. And, uh, and um, I've, I've only recently come to the realization that it, it has to be the responsibility of men to have the moral cu courage to end this slaughter of the innocents. Uh, <clears throat> an importantly, an increasingly important destroyer of feminism as a political force will be the men's rights movement, the MRM. So I'm delighted to report from this conference that the MRM is not wavering in its long-standing opposition to feminism. The MRM has long been engaged with the task of raising public consciousness about feminism and men's issues, and will be engaged with that task for decades to come. A metaphor I often use for the MRM is that we're trying to climb Everest. We may still be in the foothills, but we're making progress and climbing steadily. And there's been a strong sense of that. I think at each of the five ICMIs, there's been a feeling that, you know what, we've, you know, we've, 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 you know, we've, we've ascended Everest a little bit more. Um, public understanding of men's issues and feminism is growing, largely due to social media. So as, as we might expect, it's among younger adults in particular that the understanding is growing. In time, this will inevitably feed into the mainstream media covering our issues, and it's a question of when, not if, that will happen. I think MRAs should be really, really proud of what they've achieved online. But while online work is necessary, it's not sufficient. Feminist influence in the offline world, the real world, goes from strength to strength to this day. And frankly, I, I continue to be deeply disappointed by the reluctance, and I don't want to go for shaming, but I am disappointed by the reluctance of MRAs to get away from their bloody keyboards and to meet up with other like-minded like men and women and engage in real-world campaigning. We, we refer to the men's rights movement, but the average, the average citizen sees no evidence of the existence of this movement from one decade to the next. None. 
we're all but invisible to the general public, and we have to change that. MRAs so MRAs continue to spend way too much time in the online men's rights bubble, but only a very small proportion of the general public is in that bubble. To reach the general public will require far more MRAs to get away from their keyboards, leave the bubble, and engage with the general public. It's why I and others campaign at Speaker's Corner in London every, every, every two weeks. And uh, every time, many, many people, usually men, but sometimes women, stop for a chat or take our leaflets, um, you know, take photographs of our placards and so on. And those chats are almost always positive. So to those of you who could go in for activism, such as street campaigning, leaflet, handing out leaflets and so on, and you have a reluctance because you'd be uncomfortable doing it, I, I say this to you. It's not about you. It's not about your comfort. It's about the people who are suffering, people who sorely need your support. It's about the fathers who don't see their children after family breakdowns, uh, all too many of whom commit suicide as a result. It's about the children who are emotionally abused because they're denied access to their fathers and grandparents. It's about the grandparents denied access to their beloved grandchildren. It's about the men who are battered by their partners and find there's no support available for them. It's about the men who've had their genitals mutilated as minors on religious or cultural grounds. So I strongly urge you to step outside your comfort zone, put the keyboard to one side, and engage in activism to support these people. They, they, they deserve your support. And I, I don't know of a better way to meet up with like-minded people than through Network for Men. Their network is networkformen.org. Uh, um, they've enabled men to get together in many countries, not just the UK, where, 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 where they were launched. And in the UK, we also have Red Pill Connect. That's red-pill.uk, which caters for both men and women in the UK. Finally, this year is, of course, the 50th anniversary of men landing on the moon. Men. Why were there no women there? Because they weren't expected to return, I think. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the kind of the truth. Um, anyway, sorry, enough levity. Um, my, my, my final comments today were inspired by a famous speech given by President John F. Kennedy to a large crowd gathered at Rice Stadium in Houston, Texas in 1962. The speech was part of the drive to persuade the American people to support the Apollo uh, moon, program, moon landings program. And I say this to the men's rights movement to, today. We choose to destroy feminism as a public force, not because it will be easy, but because it will be hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone. And one we intend to win. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very kind. Thank you very much. <coughs> and sorry, for, sorry for getting a bit, you know, <coughs> one or two points there. And it, it happened in Australia. <laughs> I need to get, get a grip, don't I? I just need to... <laughs> I know it is. More, more for me than you, probably. Anyway, anyway. Do you know it's about the only time I cry is at ICMIs? <laughs> Yeah, well, why do we come? It's so sad. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I think we've got seven or eight minutes if anybody has any, any questions. Since I'm the closest, I guess I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll start one. Um, great speech, Mike. Thank uh, you. Not to correct you, I don't know if I heard you correct or not, about divorced men committing suicide. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. male suicide rate uh, triples. Uh, and I think yeah. certainly in the US and in the UK. Well, yeah. um, I don't want to, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I just finished my book, as you know, and ah, it's yes. male suicide, and yep. one of the things I found out and I put in there, and it was shocking to me that the BMJ, British Medical Journal, just put out that divorced men are 10 times, 9.7, so it's 9.7 times. Is it 9.7 times. times the female suicide rate? Yes, exactly. Okay, well, so that right, but, but we aren't actually disagreeing, yeah, uh, so because the, the baseline is around three and a half. Yeah. Um, and it triples to about 10. Okay, so I was just trying to add So Yes, yeah, so there's, there's two ways of looking at the data. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what I kind of thought. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's that. And then 
the other thing that came out was um, like India. India is getting nine times the increase of male suicide because yeah. they're changing the dowry laws, yes. the laws that are very biased to favor women and go against the men. And then the only other country, the only exception in the world is in China, and we call it the worth, worth correlation. Women aren't worth as much in China, right? so they're actually committing suicide more than uh, men. Right. It's, it's women. Okay. So that's the only exception. Right. And India is another example of what you do in a major quick change, what it will do to the male society suicide. So hence society yeah. kills men. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for your No pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you for your speech. I just have a question. Um, so you mentioned that it's, it seems like you kind of want to stop abortion, and I was just wondering what your position on that is. Like, is it, is it, are you like an abortion absolutist? Like, do you think, like, for example, the morning after pill is considered an abortion? Or are you talking about clinical abortion? Or are you talking about viability? And um, also, if you are, like, okay with abortion, uh, sorry, there are just three different parts, sorry. Um, if you're okay with abortion, how many times do you think a woman uh, should have it? And also, in the case of um, a, a father, for example, who, who doesn't actually want a child, and let's say the woman agree, would you say that it's, all, it's okay for uh, abortion to happen? Okay. Well, uh, of course, I mean, nobody, well, I won't say nobody, but uh, certainly... Uh, well, Alabama uh, wants absolute abortion. Uh, okay, yeah. all right. Mm -hmm. but, but, I mean, I, I think there's enough questions there to deal with without worrying about Alabama. Okay. But, but, but um, <laughs> no, uh, our, our position, we actually spent quite a bit of time in, in, in formulating our position for, the, for, the, for our last election manifesto. Okay. Uh, and um, we, 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 we came down, in the UK, the, the, the term limit for abortion is 24 weeks. Um, now, is that based on viability? Well, no, no. I, I'm pretty sure that was in the original 1967 Abortion Act. Okay. And of course, I mean, 52 years ago, uh -huh. no 24-week baby survived. Okay. But now, I understand the odds. You know, if you want to save a 24-week-old um, fetus uh -huh. or embryo, a fetus, I think, um, you got more than the 50, 50 chance. So, you know, you could have the absolutely morally indefensible position in, in a hospital of, of, of a medical team of two medical teams in operating theatres next to each other, uh -huh. both with a woman uh, with a 24-week-old embryo, uh -huh. um, the fetus, uh, and the the the, the, um, the 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 you know the team in this room killing uh -huh. that child, and the and in the other one um, doing everything they can to save it. It's just utterly morally indefensible. And uh, uh, um, one of the reasons that we we settled for 13 weeks. For which there's actually quite a bit of popular support in the UK, actually. Okay, so your your limit is 13 weeks. It's, it's 13. Is, is it unlimited number uh, in your case, or do you think there should be a limit, like like she could have like 10 abortions or something? <laughs> that's not something we've ever considered. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> it's um, that's too horrible to even even contemplate. Okay. But but one of the reasons for 13 weeks is that uh, at least five years ago when we looked at this, it wasn't generally possible to to determine the sex of the of the fetus. Okay. Uh, and and um, there is definitely a problem. Um, in, in some communities of sex specific, mm -hmm. um, you know, as we get in China and India. Okay. Um, but there's also, we've had cases of feminists saying, you know, when, when they find out that they have a male, uh, you know, they're carrying a male, mm -hmm. aborting it. Okay. So what yeah. is your position of father's rights in terms of fathers not wanting the unborn child? Um, I, I don't, no, I don't see that as a reason for, for, for an abortion. I, I don't think abortion is, there's, there's very few problems for which abortion is, is the solution, quite frankly. Um, right, but what I'm saying is like, since it seems like you are pro-abortion in terms of the 13-week... Um, I'm, I'm certainly not pro-abortion, but, but, but no, I, th I think you I know, mean, you're you, you've got sorry, to draw a line so, somewhere. So, sorry, you're pro-choice. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I take that back. You're, you're pro-choice in that the 13 weeks, um, but the 13 weeks, it's decided by the mother. Um, I'm simply saying that is, does the father have a role uh, in terms of, like, for example, if the father doesn't want a child, the mother sort of does, like, what kind of leverage does the well, father have? Well, I think have? that goes into the whole area of, of reproductive rights, doesn't it? The, the, where women have all the rights and men right. have the responsibilities that, yeah, so that, that women want to curious. push on them. But no, I, I think that the, I mean, some people have said, do you, you know, would you uh, be happy for abortion to happen at the behest of men um, when the woman still wanted to carry it? And to uh -huh. me, that's just so horrible that... Okay. Uh, the, the, the so could, you haven't considered it? That's no, no, no. Okay. Well, n n not not come to a sort of to to, to a position on it. Mm -hmm. But but um, I mean, the, the reality is that probably, 
I mean, some people think that probably 65 or 70 percent of pregnancies in the UK, and I'm sure we're not 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 unique, mm -hmm. are basically paternity fraud. I mean, uh, okay. particularly women uh, on the pill who um, is very reliable taken properly, and and um, I've heard it called upsing, where you know women on the pill mysteriously become pregnant mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in quite serious numbers. And mm -hmm. that is paternity fraud. Mm -hmm. But we have in the UK, I mean, there's two or three different varieties of paternity fraud, but the Crown has never brought a prosecution for it. Okay. It's just, you know, it's, not, it's never seen to be in the public interest if it advantages women. That's, that's you know, I don't, I don't think that's black and white anywhere, but that's how, that's how the things roll. Okay, well, thank you for your answer. Thank you, thank you. We're... we're, we're I mean, since, since I'm a bit of a demon timekeeper, um, we've got like one minute left. Is, is everyone okay with just one more question? S sorry, John. <laughs> Hi. You've spoken about your frustration with a lot of people not wanting to publicly step up and support um, MRA positions. Um, and the one thing that always jumps to mind is that there are so many places, specifically workplaces, that will... Uh, they are aggressively hostile to anything that is remotely, even slightly non-feminist. And uh, something that jumps to mind is Dr. Sean Smith's talk the other day, where he said, well, you have to be selfish enough to understand that if you don't take care of yourself, you can't help anybody else. Mm. What would you say as someone like myself, who would not want to publicize his positions uh, flagrantly because uh, he doesn't want to be uh, unemployed and homeless? No, I, 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 would, I, would, I would never try and encourage someone to put themselves in a position that they would lose their lose their jobs and their livelihoods, but but I mean things. Like, let's say I mean I go back to Speaker's Corner because we're there every two weeks. You know, um, Brits could turn up there and say that their name's Harry Johnson or something, to, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, or whatever. You know, um, Donald Trump or whatever they want to call themselves. You know, and 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 hand out leaflets and engage with people <laughs> without anyone knowing their identity, and. Um, Okay. I mean, I've got to say, if, if, if someone asked me if, if you're a North American, you know, uh, um, um, you know, if I were one, what, what would I do? And I, I think I'd, I'd uh, become as I'd, I'd become an intactivist, because I, I think that you know, there's some, there's a lot of great activism over here. I mean, I'm thinking about a guy called Brother K, and um, yeah, and do, doing amazing things, just amazing things. And people are forever uh, American supporters and donors are forever sending me. Uh, uh, articles where he's turned up with his, with his band of merry men, and you know, and and and, and, so, and so, so, some, there's some women supporting them as well. Um, it is such an extraordinary issue, American uh, circumcision. The rest of the world looks on on looks on United States with utter disbelief in the area of MGM. But I'm, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. But but it's but it's something. It, it, you know, it's an issue. The, the 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 double standard is so appalling that that I think in terms of sort of bang for your buck, so to speak, you know. Uh, MGM, I, 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 um, you know, there should be sort of like protests outside hospitals because I mean, regular hospitals are doing this damn butchery, aren't they? Um, yeah, and I think I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.